Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Marinefield. So I've, I've got the graveyard shift, so hopefully we'll keep you awake now after lunch. Um, just the first announcement on that. I was not supposed to actually do the presentation. It actually was supposed to be done by my business partner, but due to personal circumstances and with a family tragedy, I had to jump in at the last minute, so please bear with me if things just don't quite work as smooth as you might expect them to. First of all, around e-commerce, people saying, "As what are we going to do about it? Well, you can try to learn from history. But remember, this is history, and as we know, if you look at the financial papers, it does say the past is never a good indicator of the future, as this little boy actually tells you. On the other hand is, we also know that things are changing very quickly. You know, the, our revolution, our evolution of things, such as print media going over to modern technologies, the cycle is ever, ever for going faster. The amount of information that we are able to carry increases every day. And last but not least, people always saying as well, they always come to us and saying as well, can we benchmark and can we compare ourselves to others? And they're saying as well, what are you benchmarking yourself against then? Are you trying to catch up? Are you want to overtake? And actually, are you benchmarking something that is actually completely relevant for your market? Because it might be no good to benchmark your certain KPIs that actually don't apply. So be careful what you do. In terms of the presentation, we're going to try to sort of summarize it into sort of a few key points. A bit of a com comparison between and contrast between what we know between Europe and South Africa. Look at some experience and projects we've done in the past. Something around how do we move forward. You can't ignore the Amazon effect if we talk about this. And we have to uh, we summarize with some of the must do's out of this presentation of the things that we've so found out. If we take a look, what are the key differences? Well, there we go. The number of internet users in Europe, there's 821 million internet users, 74% of the population, compared to about 10% of the population. Yes, it's increasing. It was 6% a few years ago. It's now 10% over here. But again, there's still a lot of people who are not actually accessing that particular medium. Also, smartphone coverage. 4G is the way of the standard anywhere in Europe now. Even in the quite remote areas, you are able to get 4G and share with WhatsApp and Instagram if you talk to my kids. It's about 30% geographic coverage here. You look at e-commerce, 81% of the population does e-commerce. My sons got involved at the age of 12 because they wanted a PayPal account. They were not old enough to have a bank account, but they can have a PayPal account to go shopping because they wanted to go and buy whatever. In South Africa, it is actually still quite a privilege. There's a certain income level required uh, for people to start becoming e-commerce uh, active. Delivery. And we'll come and talk a bit more about that in a, in a minute. Next day, same day, is more or less the norm now, especially in the UK. Uh, in certain other countries, it's a bit longer because of the geographic capabilities. Over here, it's more around the convenience as well as getting access to overseas uh, products that may not be available locally. One of the other things is payment. In Europe, the, the penetration of credit cards, PayPal, debit cards is widespread. This is, there's still a high level of cash economy in this, in this country. You can see it this far, in Sweden, cash has been more or less outlawed by the government. You can't even pay for a drink any longer at the bar because they say cash is not king. It is actually goes so far that when I was stopped by a beggar and he says, can I have some money please? Can I share? And I says, sorry, no cash. And he says, no problem. And he showed me his chip and pin device. That put me on the spot, <laughs> okay? Technology moves on. Let's take a look at the infrastructure. The infrastructure, it's not only about the road infrastructure, but it is actually about the choice to use that infrastructure. Next day delivery, same day delivery, the number of couriers, the type of courier service they offer, one man, two man, one and a half man. Trust me, what that's an interesting one, because how to get one and a half men in a van, but we'll talk, see that. But also, how do you find your customers? The postcode system in the UK is most probably quite unique. It's down to street level. 
I live in a postcode and I know exactly what it is. If I have the house number and the postcode, you type it in and Google Map will actually drop it to pin exactly on the house that I live. Well, in many countries, it's still city only. How do you find that location? You need to find alternative methods, such as, I don't know if you've heard of, what three words? Yeah? As an alternative to actually being able to locate the drop point. And last but not least, we're time poor. It's all about being having an established omnichannel network. I want to buy it in, and order it in one place. I want to get it delivered in a second place, return it in a third place, and like the replacement in a fourth place. Or, and I want the money back. Yeah. So all of that has to be integrated. Yeah. Having not getting your returns back in a store and says, I'm sorry, you bought it somewhere else, is a non-goer. I will never re repeat that experience. Yes, there are lots of differences, but there are also some similarities. Click and collect is actually an ideal environment in a cash economy because you go to the store, you pay for your product. Yeah, in where we're working in Russia, it's in exactly that. You get the yellow code, post-it note in through the box. You go to the post office, you pick up the product, you pay for it. There are alternative methods of getting to that. Mobile payment, you do not have to jump to the cash and credit card, to the credit card uh, banking system. Alternative payment methods, such as mobile phone payments, such as uh, experiments in, uh, if you go to Kenya, where this is a standard way of doing transaction. Yeah, you can actually just jump a generation in the development. Let's take a look at some of the bigger players around. I'll talk about Amazon later, but as you can see, everyone is driving high percentage increases in growth year on year on their web sale and in all, across all markets. But not everyone is a winner. I've just highlighted two there, Staples and the Home, Delivery, uh, home Retail Group, which is Argos. They have reported year-on-year -year reductions. Why is that? Well, Staples offers business services, paper, etc. Funny enough, Amazon Basics is taking a huge chunk of that. I haven't ordered any paper, gone down to Staples to buy paper. Amazon Basic delivers four or five reams or boxes of paper every couple of weeks into the office. I don't even have to reorder it. They know when I need it. Yeah. Home Retail Group, sending a lot of products that are available from the Amazon marketplace. Why do I need to go and shop? I have a much better variety, a much better price competitive area in the marketplace from Amazon. Well, there's results as a consequence. A lot of these places have lose as a consequence of losing stores. Yeah? And as a result, you will see things like the high street start closures, House of Fraser, Woolworth, Toys R Us, Mothercare, Maplima. All of these are major retail chains in the UK that are closing stores or have actually disappeared completely. And it will not stop. Is that the problem? Not really. Yeah. Because, because what happens is retail has never, never been stable. It changes continuously. Yeah, if you were in the presentation before lunch uh, with Chep, they had a similar picture up. What they're saying is, well, after World War II in Europe, people bought in the corner shop. Every day, bought a little bit. Then supermarkets emerged, department stores, etc. And with that, a technology to support those capabilities. So it, retail always has changed, and it will just need to reinvent itself. One of these aspects is the, the retail store. What will happen to it? Will it become experience stores? You know, if you think about Apple Store, you go in there not to buy an Apple product. You go there to go and play with Apple. And then you buy the Apple product online. And if you can't use it, you go and get, get some help uh, in the store then. But here's some of the big statistics from ONS. 58% of non-food online shopping in the UK was spent with non-store retailers. That's the reason Argos and some of those guys are going br br bust, because you're just shopping differently. We are shopping differently. We don't want to walk down to the store. We don't want to go and spend our weekends in the shopping mall. We actually just want to have the product. Slight tact of focus, and we change. Let's take a look at e-grocery. We normally do our weekly shop. That was the way we normally went. One big weekly shop, went into a hypermarket, went to do, to do it. To be honest, I haven't done a big supermarket shop at least for three months. First thing is store to home. What's the first model that came and that, that emerged? You've got the stores, might as well just pick in the stores. Early adopter was Tesco's actually. 
Yeah. And then a late adopter was Morrison's, and Morrison still can't make it work. They were just late to the game in this one. Click and collect. Well, that was very typically. Came actually more or less out of the people like Argos. It's a standard model that they operated in. B&Q introduced uh, click and collect. And when we worked with B&Q, it's about 12 years ago on that, they said, oh, click and collect will never ever work in a DIY store, 60,000 products. What we find out is that the consumer actually was frustrated. You want to do a project, do your bathroom, repaint your living room, assemble something. And what they were frustrated in, they went into this big store and that widget that they needed to finish the project was missing. Guess what? With click and collect, we guaranteed that everything was there. They went in there, got everything, didn't have to go rummage around trying to find all the parts. They got it, could go home and actually get on with their DIY project. Highly successful. Initially, nobody thought it would work. Ocado, warehouse to home. You've got the specialist retail. Ocado being sort of Europe's largest dedicated online only e grocery retailer. And new entrants are coming in that area as well. A bit of a funny one is drive throughs. In France, you have something called Le Drive from uh, Le Marché. Actually, it was done not because they wanted to do it, it was a necessity in this case. They wanted to open stores somewhere in the smaller towns, and the local shopkeepers then rallied together and said this to the council, you can't let them open a supermarket. It will be detrimental to our little shops because Le Marché will compete with us. So they didn't get planning permission to open a supermarket. But they could get planning permission for a warehouse, so they put up a warehouse, effectively a dark store. Picked the stuff, you drove up with your car, opened your boots, somebody came out, and drops your bags in the back because it's all prepaid. That was legal. And you can find Le Drive everywhere in France now. Yeah. In the UK, major grocers like Tesco, Sainsbury's, they've all copied that model, and you can have an, uh, as well as a collect. The big problem here is, is if you do a store to home delivery, it's about 100 pounds a shopping basket, compared to about 60 pounds for click and collect order, compared to 30 pounds going in a supermarket. So you can see some of the errors, the impacts of the dynamics, because it actually does mean they don't make money. But what does it mean if you actually want to do e-grocery? E-grocery is a seven, day, seven days a week business. And it's from an early morning to a late evening. And it's one hour slots. It is an extremely tough business to be in. 100 pounds, typical shopping basket, needs to be delivered in that hour, in the right sequence, with the right product, and better have not too many substitutions. Yeah. How will that evolve? We don't know. But again, they actually don't make money. It costs them typically about 15 pounds to go and pick an order using the staff in the store. And they only charge you five pounds to seven pounds for a delivery or even free of charge. With a 3% margin on a product, typically net, more, net, net margins, you can calculate what it costs them to do. It's not much in it. But one of the things is interesting. Aston sends Bayberry's plant merger to become the second biggest, or actually then the biggest retailer to overtake Tesco's. The top three retailers have about 60% market share. With Asta and Sainsbury's together, they will be by far the biggest. And one of the reasons they cited in their request for, for approval is Amazon. Because of Amazon Fresh coming into, the, into Europe potentially. If you take a look at Walmart, when Walmart with a competition in the United States, Walmart reduced on 2 million items of the 35 pounds below to guarantee the value. What did Amazon do? free Amazon Prime for non-Prime customers to combat it. It's a run down, it's an extremely competitive environment. Let's take a look around how to actually do this fulfillment, e-grocery. E-grocery evolution. The first one is easy, it's store fulfillment. I go in the store, I send somebody around with a trolley, give them some plastic bags, a shopping list, put it in. It's ready to be dispatched. Creates a huge problem, store congestion. Because it's not a nice experience, even if you do it out of office, out of store hours, which on a, when they're open 24 hours, you might do it at night when you've got less customers. But during the daytime, especially if you want to try to fulfill it, they get in the way, and it does not make a nice experience. 
But here's some interesting aspect. When Tesco introduced it, they said, easy, we can do this. They walked to the shelf and noticed it wasn't there. They have, but their computer system told them 97% availability of the product. So why wasn't it there? Can't have been nicked, can't have been shopped yet. We've got so much of it. What they've noticed, they actually had 79% availability. Yeah. So one out of five products were not available. So I order 40 products in my typical shopping basket between 40 and 60 items. 20%, 20% again is something as what I didn't order. I'm not a happy bunny. So the shopping experience initially was extremely poor. So what did Tesco's do? First of all is they invested heavily in their IT systems to actually get their real, understand their real availability in the store. They got it right very quickly, yeah, with a huge amount of effort to get it up there. And as a consequence, it became much better. Then the next thing to do was to actually say, well, let's take all our traffic out. It's really simple. We'll take a shed somewhere usually in an urbanized area like London, because you need to make a dark store work, you need somewhere between 10 and 15,000 orders a week as a critical mass to make it pay for itself. You're paying for the staff, you're paying for the, for the rent, the rates, you know, the, the electricity to keep the cooling in. At least the fit that was cheap, is all the stuff that the other supermarkets didn't need any longer, the old cooling racks and the old shelves, it don't have to look pretty, we can just copy the store and use the old stuff. So we actually helped them to set a couple of those up and learn from it. One of the biggest issues is substitution still. So how do we substitute products? Because you've ordered a bottle of wine or you've ordered some olive oil. It's not available. We then came up with an algorithm actually in saying is, well, we start learning, a learning algorithm. If a we substituted a product and the customer accepted that substitution, we accept that that substitution is a better substitution than our guess. And if we start building up on that knowledge, so more so on those substitutions, we can actually pretty much guess, well, you didn't accept the walnut tree olive oil, you most probably are quite happy to take the garlic-infused olive oil or the basil-infused olive oil. So you start learning some of these mechanisms and you start building some intelligence actually in the, in the substitution. So as you can see, we start investing in IT around the picking mechanisms and how to make that a bit more attractive. Problem is, if you go in a supermarket, how are they laid out? Good, better, best, or crap? Well, that's what I pay, that's too expensive. Yeah, yeah. talking to the normal consumer, especially male. Uh, you buy in the middle. That's normally not what you want to try to sell as the most popular, because actually the funny is they sell the cheapest stuff the most. So we start relaying out the dark stores, actually using some ABCs, popular products together, less popular products in a slightly lot, but in different locations, so we, you have to reach up. You know, it costs you 2.2 seconds if you want to reach up and pick something. Now, yeah, an extra 1.8 seconds if you have to go and bend your knees. So you can actually start optimizing this in a very, very simple structure. And we start putting some conveyors in, so I don't actually have to drag a trolley, so you can just shovel it along. So, that's great. Still a big problem. It takes four hours. We had four hours between and we all received the order before we could actually start delivering it because we didn't know where all the stuff is and all the lot of orders, you're pushing it through. Lots of little these cages that you have, these are the totes. So we had to think, of about, well, think about something else. The other thing is it's starting to become popular. And guess what? Our yard space is too small. We can't actually turn the vehicles quickly enough in the back of the yard to offload the empty totes and put the new totes on to get them out on the road again. It took us an hour. Truck arrive, take everything off, get the new ones off in the right sequence, because when you get to somebody's house, you want to make sure that they're all in the right sequence, getting checked. Three temperature regimes, frozen about 3%, about a third in fresh, and the rest is ambient. And that's even changing now, more and more fresh. So, and, less, and frozen is even dying, apart from the ice cream. So, we had to do something about turning the churn and being able to sequence it. Also, we wanted to make sure that the customer can change their mind up to one hour before we start delivering. Hmm. <laughs> so what to do? We want to pick early. Now the stuff sits there. Customer changes their mind. So what we actually did is we built, took a mini load, a stacker crane, and stripped it down to absolutely nothing. Put a bit of padding around it to keep the temperatures under control and a bit of temperature control in it. 
Now we could start picking and have people running in the zones doing some efficient picking. All of those went into a stacker crane, into a se basically a sequencing buffer. Up to one hour before, oh, I changed my mind. I didn't want the rosé, I wanted the red wine. That one particular toad bee knew where it is, came out, went back to the pick zone. They took that one bottle out and put the another bottle in or added something to it. Somebody else changed their mind because they wanted to add something to the order. When they added something new, we just sent a second toad through or number 18 or 19 toads. But what happens is, is now as the, as the truck arrives at the back, basically the, the van, the empties are taken off quickly and it's just a conveyor on a roller and the totes come out in the right sequence of the way they have to be loaded to the customers to the delivery profile. One, two, three. Turnaround time was 15 minutes. Suddenly, we actually were able to churn the space in the back of the, of the, uh, of the store. And we got an extra run per vehicle per day. That saved a lot of money. So as you can see, you start building on the technology. And that's worth for experience, testing, making mistakes, having fun along the way. The next generation you wouldn't recognize it as a normal store. They look like fully automated warehouses, picking towers, conveyor systems, spiral conveyors, fully load, mini load systems, frozen stores, and et cetera. All of it all driven together and supported by a significant amount of technology. They look like warehouses. They are warehouses. Yeah? Where's the future? Well, we'll wait and see. Oops, the wrong way. On the consequence on eFood, you will find a lot of specialists pop up. A lot of smaller players like Gray's, Gourmet Foods. The interesting one is Abel and Cole, if you live in London. They have, a key, they have a key to your house. They come in, go to your kitchen, drop off your organic uh, vegetables that you have ordered from Cornwall into your kitchen, put it in place and leave. They even take the packaging with them. Now, what a service. Huh? I'm not quite sure if this would be very successful in South Africa, considering the amount of securities you guys have here, <laughs> living behind those walls. Trust me, I grew up in Asia. Your walls are nothing. Uh, let's have a quite different look at non-food retailers. Argos, Curry's, ASOS, etc., Amazon. Again. It's all around speed and accuracy. It's a low early start in the morning for deliveries. One hour slots. Weekend, well, who cares about the weekend, really? Yeah, and many, many choices as well. Same day, click and collect, alternative collection points. Yeah. One of my, I'll talk about that a bit later. But what happens actually is, where does this is? There's a perceived need of speed. This is the map of the UK and the demographics by actually just taking a picture of the light, street lights. Uh, UK wastes a lot of energy on their street lights. But if you, live in, if you are in the Coventry area, which is roughly around sort of here, within three hour drives, you cover 80% of the UK population, which is great, at least for the next day delivery point of view. And funny enough, in exactly that location, you find parcel force. You used to find CityLink, but you will find Hermes with their biggest 300-meter sorter, 50,000 parcels an hour, setting up their networks. And guess what? Everyone wants to have warehouses in that area as well, because they want the light cut off. Well, just you know, just drop it around the corner into the and get it into the hub to drive it in with a late cutoff for the next day delivery. Has a big problem. Everyone chases the a the same real estate. Everyone chases the same labor. There is no space available. It is already very crowded. But, you, but they are now moving away from that. You don't need to actually get to the hub if you have a critical volume. If I'm able to bypass the hubs and actually get from hub to hub or actually to regional depot for delivery with my critical volumes, I can offer much later cutoffs, midnight for next day. Yeah, because I am now pre-picking and pre-sorting all of my orders to the regional delivery province. I don't do a four-way sort any longer. Well, it's express, north or south. Standard delivery, north and south is a four-way sort. Very easy for your warehouse. 60-way, 100-way sort, 120-way sort in your warehouse is the standard delivery channels that you're sorting to. 
and you're making sure that these vans and these deliveries leave and actually hit two or three in the morning the, the local depot where they literally just get cross docked for local delivery next day. And just to give you sort of a bit of a case study a view of that, this was a cloud and a half hours. It was a catalog to e-commerce player. Typically, it took three to four hours. An order came in. On a good day, it took us four hours to get that order processed, picked, packed, and ready for ship. And they said, it's, it's not good enough. We're going to lose out against Amazon. All the products we have, you can buy on Amazon. What are we going to do about it? They said, we want to have it down to 45 minutes. You order, in 45 minutes, it's ready for dispatch. We want the cutoff time, minimum 10 p.m. It's actually midnight now. And it's all about customer retention. But they have the critical mass, 100,000 parcels on an average day. That's how many orders they pick and dispatch. And that's what they had to come up with. They had to come up with a solution that allows, in a very, very quick succession, talking minutes, to go run through all the stages, all the way from replan all the way to dispatch. And the business case was 80 to 90 million pound investment in the, in the infrastructure, just for that one building, to make it work. And that's how much they're spending, just to ensure that they will survive against Amazon. The last one to look at is two-man deliveries. Big, ugly items, sofas, beds, white goods. Again, delivery times early to late, usually not that late, but typically weekend, yeah, weekend deliveries. You have to pay sometimes a bit extra for it, but generally it's a two-hour two, to two hour slot to, uh, no, normally uh, that you can get. Biggest issue here? making sure that your first delivery attempt is actually w successful. You come to the first place, that person is not there, and you've got a sofa at the back of the lorry. That sofa now has to move 14 or 15 times for the rest of the day, trying to get it in and out, trying to deliver to the remaining customers. And that sofa won't look very healthy either at the end, and you most probably have to throw it away, or you make a manager special out of it. And the other problem is, it causes a huge amount of inventory problems. Minimum order quantities, Far East sourcing, all the problems that you also face. Yeah. Lack of supply chain visibility. The problem is, it's large cube items. You get it wrong with your forecast, and you're sitting on your inventory. They say, you know, you can add them quickly up. You know, 30, 50, 70,000 cubic meters make it one and a half cubic meters per large pallet this height, you're talking 50, 60,000 pallets in inventory. That costs you a lot of money to hold and manage, and it's usually quite old uh, after a while. You're sitting on this stuff. You get it wrong, you run out of warehouse space very, very quickly with two-man deliveries. This particular client has three large warehouses filled with stuff, and they can't get rid of it. Another short case study. It's a very famous UK high street retailer. This is their non-food side business. They opened this facility in 2013, designed to do about 70% retail, 30% e-com, that facility. They've got about six or seven other facilities in their network. They came then with the idea, and it says, actually, our market share, our footfall in the stores, our customers are not happy to in the store. It's just too much hassle. Tell you what, as a business direction, 30% of our business is going to become online. Doing about 5% at, at the time. Built this beautiful, uh, lovely facility. It's fully automated. Well, it does now about 70% e, e com and about 30% retail, exactly to the opposite. The result? 160 million pounds spent to build this facility, get 50% of the target performance. You plan it wrong, you change your business requirements, it costs you a lot, a lot of money. They don't know what to do with this facility. Shutting it down is a bit of an embarrassment and a waste of 160 million quid, but they may have to in the next couple of years. At least they're going to build a new one now. 
uh, that is purely e-com and then trying to recover this one and what to do with that part of their network. But then also they are the whole of the delivery models are changing very, very quickly. Click and collect, pay point. What are they doing? They're all creating additional footfall to other places that normally you would not associate going. I'm a prime example on that. I like to go for a run. I don't have a home to collect my deliveries. I don't have a delivery locker close by. So what do I do? I order click and collect. I go for a run. And part of my cooldown from that corner shop to home is about a mile. That's my cooldown run with a backpack with my stuff. And by the way, I would top up the evening dinner shop for the family along the way because it's convenient. Yeah. So that's how we are changing the way we behave. We actually don't like going to shops any longer. We do this as a necessity rather than as an entertainment value until very recently where people went to the mall to and actually did mall tours. Don't understand why, but people did mall tours going to a different city to experience. But it's the same shop. It's the same chain. But okay. What next? Well, we don't know. Things will emerge, people will try things, companies will come and go on this. Yeah. If you take about Germany, uh, there are pack stations. I don't know if you have come across pack stations. It's like the Amazon Locker. Actually, it was the Deutsche Post who invented it. The problem was the last mile, well, last mile delivery. The first uh, delivery attempt was a failure. And it cost them a huge amount of money to bring it back to the depot and then try again the next day. They were making a loss. So what they developed is these seven of these pack stations, these the lockers effectively. They dropped a note through it, and it says so you can pick it up at the following pack station. The guy then delivered to the pack station, pressed the code, the authorization code, opened three lockers, small, medium, large. He would scan the package, put it in the right box, close the box, and automatically that associated the order with a uh, with a locker, and it would then immediately with that, associated with that code. You came with your piece of paper that you had in your letterbox, you walked in, typed in the release code, popped open, you retrieved your package. In the first run, they did 1,500 of them. They were so successful. They've got 2,500 now over Germany, and they're thinking of adding another 2,500 around Germany for the deliveries. If you go into Frankfurt railway station, they only have three of them next to each other. There's not enough space to put the next one. They're so popular, there's not enough slots actually to use them daily. The products have to go back because there's not enough slots to actually put the product in. Average dwell time, under six hours, 2.2 turns per day. Yeah, very successful business model. Now you can actually dictate that you actually go to a pack station to pick up your product you, for one euro discount. In Denmark, it's one euro extra. Well, Swedish, Danish krona. They make it a premium service. If we talk about e-commerce, we can't ignore returns. And we always have this mantra with returns. Returns is your biggest supplier. Especially in fashion, 40% of fashion gets returned. So 40% of what you send out comes back again. And return center, unfortunately, don't look very pretty. So if it takes you hours, it would be great. But if it takes you weeks or days to actually get the product back into a sellable state, you're losing money, and it costs time to do it. It's very, and this marketing is, has a huge thing to answer. Try before you buy. Um, free return, you know, all really great in theory because it enhances the customer experience. With logistics, as you can see, my hair is turning gray, is one of those things that really actually drives you up the wall because you're just stuck in it. But we actually did a bit of an analysis with a, with a number of fashion retailers on why speed is so critical. For every day that the product is not available on a fashion item, the price deterioration is 0.2% per day. So if it sits an extra week, you've just lost 1.5% margin. Yeah? If it leads, sits there for three weeks or six weeks, you might as well just throw it away or send it into the discount box because you're not, you're not going to make any money. The price deterioration is quite brutal. So you start, and then you can ask the e-commerce retailers, well, what, 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 what's so important about everything? What are, you, what are, you, what are the, the things that keep you awake at night? They call, oh, acquiring customer, making a profit. Those seem to be the big driver. And the good news is logistics, only 3% of the problem. Certainly my job should be really easy all of a sudden. Uh, 
Then you actually start talking to them and saying, is actually, do you really understand what's happening? Because all of these are nice, but they actually only come down to one point. It's about customer retention. And customer retention is made effectively around customer value. And the customer value can be very defined as a formula. It's the average order value times the number of orders a customer places and the frequency he buys. If I spend 30 pounds, I do it three times before I, draw, uh, I order th three orders, and I do that every month, I know what my customer value is. If I can increase the number of items he buys and increase the basket from, for example, 1.8 items to 2.3 items, it has a huge impact on my average order value. That changes potentially the way I pick in a warehouse because suddenly I have to pick larger orders and ship larger orders. That might mean the case is too large to go down the chute or the product or whatever it is. The number of orders, obviously, so more orders are processed in the warehouse, so more congestion I have, so more challenges I will carry. And if the frequency, if I get them down from six weeks down to a reorder every four weeks, it makes my problem even worse. So actually, logistics is actually one of the key drivers, which is just most people don't recognize it. We've seen this slide before, and we've talked, I talked you through it. Where do you sit? I can't answer that. I don't know your market. I don't know your customers. Yeah. You have to adapt it and saying, is where do I want to sit? Am I just going to do a store fulfillment model? Do I invest a bit higher? But the one thing is very sure, if you are going for some of the more complex items at the bottom and setting up dedicated uh, distribution center for that, it most probably will take you two to three years to actually actually implement it and get it to work. Designing it, implementing it, getting it up and to ramp up. And the one thing is in e-commerce what we've learned is last year's peak is this year's average. And if that happens a few years running, you run out of capacity in those facilities very, very quick. So you actually often have to design to a much higher design year capacity than you initially anticipated. But that is an associated investment risk because you don't know if you're actually going to make it. However, if, you're, if you do get it wrong, you're suddenly stuck again. Well, do we put a second building now next door? Or make that one twice as big and then shut the old one down? You know, there's all of these questions. The other thing is that come drives it is the type of automation technology you can use on it. What are you going to do? Loads of choices. And if you have a chance to go to Logimat or, one of, or CMAT or some of those big conferences where they show the materials handling equipment, the choice every year gets more and more and the complexity. The big issue is all of those technologies are usually proprietary technologies with suppliers. So if I'm designing to go down a particular supplier, I'm usually pretty much locked in about adding different kit to it. It's very difficult to extend it. So what we always talk with our customers is about creating a scalable platform. Don't be trying to get yourself your lockdown. Create the intimate layer, the WES or WCS, where they have the flexibility to actually attach different types of equipment, as long as it is, you're able to extend it. So I have this technology this year. I need a new sorter. I chuck another one out, but I don't want the sorter from the same supplier because I want that one over there because it's a better piece of kit for my, that serves my purpose. I want to install that one in that, kit, in that machine. Or I want that mini load system, that stacker crane, or that shuttle. So you want to start having that flexibility in how you integrate. And that's why you need a scalable intermediate platform and not to be locked in. Learning from others. Just recently did a project, and the customer says, well, we need to do a strategy project. How much do you want to spend? Ooh, a couple of hundred thousand pounds. It's an important piece on the investment. And he says, to be honest, what are you going to do? Are we going to open stores here and here and here and here and here and everything? And that's our rollout plan. And we need to understand where the warehouses are. Well, very simple. And Frenzel knows about it. He says, to be honest, can you let's have a look where all your competitors have their warehouses? Because that's pretty much most probably what you, where you want to be. And funny enough, we're now trying to find a piece of land within about 60 miles, go back or forth, because trying to find a large piece of land the way you can build a big shed. They're not that easy to buy, but it's going to be somewhere in that 60-mile radius yeah, in Europe. Returns, again, make sure what you promise. Because if you get that wrong with the, loca with the location a bit, but with the returns and how you process it, 
you may actually damage your brand. And if you think about some of them in the past, if you remember Boo.com, yeah, and they, they went too fast, too thin, too wide, too quickly, and didn't survive it. Yeah. The idea was great, slightly bit early maybe, as well as in the market, but they just didn't make it. But also is, is what you promise. One of the, we were, I was working on a project unrelated to what we're doing at the time, and, says, and the customer decided it was the introduction of Black Friday in the UK. Great, Asta introduced it because they did it in the United States with Walmart. Two years later, Asta pulled out of Black Friday, the course that basically started it and caused you, everyone else, the headache because now people are still doing it. A big high-end retailer, average order value, 80 pounds per item, decided they're going to do Black Friday as well. They didn't expect the 1,600% uplift on Black Friday. They failed to deliver before Christmas. A serious problem with their brand. It cost them two years nearly in recovery because people didn't trust of that they were able to deliver in the next, in the next year. Amazon, can't ignore them. 244 DCs in the US. Last year, they built 63. The year before, they built 109. Typical gross, 23 to 28% year on year. In Europe, they're going to build 1,300 more facilities for local deliveries in the next few years. They're a game changer. They will cause problems for the other retailers. Next day delivery, pop-up warehouses. If you think about the technology with the little Kava robots, guess what? That's an infrastructure that I can build overnight. I just need a basically a car park, put a tent on it, chuck a couple of Kava robots on, and get people to go and pick. And if I don't need it anymore for Christmas, I can take that whole infrastructure in the back of a van and drive away. It's not a reason they bought it that I, they want to buy, they bought it so that other people can't use it. Yeah. In the meantime, there are other players in the market who offer that. But that's the re one of the reasons they went into it. When will they come into South Africa? Well, don't know, but I'm pretty certain they will. Yeah, it's only a question of timing. But what are they doing so different? They're integrating a lot of technology into their, uh, into their, in, into their, into their offering. It's not just going online and doing the website that we all love and hate, but it's actually things like Alexia making the technology and the integration easy to you to do your shopping. Yeah. When's the last time you couldn't buy a product that you wanted on Amazon? Most probably, apart from maybe something illegal, most probably not, okay? That's because actually, it's a marketplace. And the majority of the products that they sell, they don't even have in their stock. They just take a cut of the profit of the revenue. They just offer it, it's shipped directly, you buy it, you ship it, they just do the handling in between, the financial handling and the catalog management. And, they are, and that's continued to, en to enhance. At the moment, Amazon has, according to, to the latest statistics, about a 33 to 44% market share in, a, in the different markets. By 2021, they're gonna have a 50% market share. And that's gonna be a huge, it's already a change of a place for, for concern, and it will become even worse. But actually, if you then actually sort of start looking at the customer expectations of what you are when you ask people, why do you use Amazon? Oh, I'll give you all sorts of answer. But it actually comes to down some very, very few points. Well, price, the Amazon pricing algorithm, always looking for the cheapest. It helps you to do a race to the bottom. And funny enough, if you buy it from Amazon directly, it's usually slightly more expensive, if you ever would have noticed. And by the way, if you're an Apple user, you by the way, you pay extra. Oh, yeah? Safari users are noticed to be less price sensitive. Uh, if you use Firefox or Google Chrome, you slightly get a better price. <laughs> you thought you were, your browsing history was secure. Think again. Not with Amazon. Selection, choice, speed of delivery, Amazon Prime. Same day delivery, all of these options available. But it comes down to one word, convenience. I can have it now, when I want it, where I want it. And when they do come, they cause quite a lot of problems in the local market. Where I live in Milton Keynes, Amazon opened a shop. 
a little big store. Funny enough, all the other warehouse people, warehouses in the area, and I live in Warehouse City, not enough staff to actually operate them. It literally dry, changes the market. Amazon pays a bit better. They attract the people. It's not the nicest environment people claim to work. I would say it's a warehouse. I would think it's actually not bad. The technology they use, especially with mobile devices, the learning, it doesn't take to get a person to 70% productivity in two or three days. This is done in hours. It's literally measured in hours. In some of the warehouses in, the, in Germany, they have 50 people at a time that get hired in for the day. They sit in a room like this, and you have a number. Group number one, please. Up you go. You're in the warehouse. Group number two, please. Group number three, etc. And they just recruit them day by day and push them in the warehouse. So they drive market. And the worst thing about it is the people who actually work there and quit tend never to go back into another warehouse. They usually want to go and work somewhere else. They actually get turned off for going into another warehouse which actually means is your labor problem becomes even worse because actually the number of people that you can now recruit. And if you think Amazon's a problem, oops, Amazon, in a three-day total, did $14.5 billion in sale. Had a 45 to 55% market share for Black Friday and Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday. You think that's a big number? On a single day, Alibaba did 25.3 billion. JD.com, 19.1 billion. And it's growing. At the moment, they don't have much ambitions to go internationally. If Alibaba does have to decide to go internationally, we'll have it from both sides, from the east and the west being squeezed. Those are real threats as well. And by the way, I shop on Alibaba. I buy lots of bits and come. I'm quite willing to wait for the longer delivery time to get it out of China. Because the price and competitiveness to get certain components are so cheap. Even machine, to drill, machine parts that I want, I can get for a fraction of the price. Fine, if, I've got, if I can live with the lead time to get it air freighted in, still a lot of cheaper. Just to quickly summarize now, what are the key success factors? Well, first of all, embrace technology. Yeah, and be open to it. Don't try to be busy fools with the technology. Really look out of what's out there and what's coming down the line. Make sure that you actually move with the times. Make sure you manage your stock on hand. Make sure you understand what your real inventory position is across the total supply chain. If you can't do that, you will struggle to make any headway. Obviously, a fantastic after-sales service, because if you can't deliver to your promise and actually get the product back and make the customers appreciate it, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any of those things are really, really hard mistresses. Your brand and your reputation can be destroyed within minutes. Yeah, if there's something trends, it hurts. Obviously, offer reliable distribution. Make sure you've got the right warehouse. You've got the infrastructure to support it. The right network, next day delivery, same day deliveries, two to five days, whatever it is you require to do, and make sure that you can deliver to it. And last, not least, just make sure that you plan for step changes. Like I said, last year's peak will be this year's average and the business will just take step changes. You will be surprised on how quickly it does actually move up. And you need to plan for step changes as technologies emerge. That's to conclude my presentation. I hope you find it a bit of entertaining. Thank you very much for listening. And if you want to talk to me about diving, I'm happy to talk about that as well.